Hi, James Proctor here, Managing Director of the Intec Group. And uh, this is the first part of a three-part series on robotic process automation, or sometimes referred to as IPA, Intelligent Process Automation. All right, so let's just get right into the concepts here. The first part is just underlying key concepts, laying the groundwork for basic uh, understanding of RPA, for those that haven't been involved in it. Uh, then I'm going to move on in, in uh, part two, talk about some, uh, <clears throat> some opportunities uh, for identifying RPA in your particular organization, maybe talk a little bit about analyzing those opportunities as well. Then in part three, what we're going to do is talk about the role of people versus the role of technology. Now, that's an important conversation to have. Uh, I talk a lot about technology uh, in uh, my various training courses and uh, in my work with various clients. And RPA in particular creates anxiety when you start having uh, conversations about that. So we just want to understand the role of technology, the role of people, and the balance between that and where it's going, and it, it kind of lowers that anxiety level a little bit. All right, so let's just jump uh, right into it. Let's go over here to, um, and I'd like to start that with, uh, why are we here conversation? Now, many of us uh, watching this video, right, uh, we have a lot of business analysts, business systems analysts, number of a lot of technical people probably, a uh, number of subject matter experts, these kinds, uh, you know, these types of roles. So from that perspective, and let's start off with the concept of why we're here for better requirements. It could be business requirements, business system requirements, but better requirements, right? And we, uh, what do we mean by better? I mean complete requirements, unambiguous requirements, validated requirements, delivered faster. Now business requirements are great, they're fun to do, and I love doing business requirements, but it's really a stepping stone, if you will, to better business systems, right? What do I mean by better, right? Effective functionality, it works, it creates a lot of value, creates great customer experiences, less maintenance intensive, uh, delivered f faster, uh, you know, to our to our customers. Right? Now, and I love building business systems <laughs> as well, but that's still a stepping stone to creating value. And we create value through business process, right? So business systems support business process. And great business processes are business processes that enable an organization to be highly effective in whatever the, 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 the products and their services and customers and all the kinds of things they do, highly efficient in creating that value, and very agile in being able to adapt to things over time. And if we're able to do that, right, we create a lot of business value, right? We delight our stakeholders, create a lot of value, and that's really <laughs> why we're here, right? And RPA is an important component of that. So let's just r jump right into the, some basic concepts here. Now, in order to create a framework for thinking about RPA, think about the two basic, I call dimensions of an organization. We have the vertical dimension and we have the horizontal dimension. Now, the vertical dimension, right, it's one, you know, people often kind of think about uh, most intuitively. It's the vertical stack of the organization, right? We have reporting relationships, right? We have, uh, you know, uh, we got a... We got the CEO, we got senior VPs, and we got managers, and, and we got uh, associates, and you, know, you get the concept, right? We have a whole vertical reporting relationship. Typically, we have you know business units, and within business units, maybe we have departments, and within departments, we have work teams and things like that. So it's a whole vertical structure, and pretty pretty much every organization is organized vertically, and organized organizations are organized vertically from a reporting a managerial uh, standpoint, right? Now, the other dimension is the horizontal dimension. That's the business process dimension, right? So each of these little rounded rectangles here, right, are work activities in a business process, just a notional business process here. And maybe we're going to enter an order, and after we enter an order, maybe we, uh, if it's a new customer, we, the order gets routed one way. If it's an existing customer, it goes another way. Uh, the uh, the uh, order then gets fulfilled, and we pack it and ship it, or whatever it is. We're just a, a lot of work activities, because that's all the business process is, is a sequence of work activities. Right. So we have vertical organizational structures. We've got horizontal workflow, work activities in the workflow. Now, here's where RPA comes into play. I call it splitting the atom of the work activity. And one of the things, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in, later in this section and a lot more in, in part two. But basically, we can look at any work activity in a business process and ask ourselves, well, let's deconstruct that work activity and let's look at the procedure performing the activity. And some part of that procedure is going to be what I call mechanical rules-based kind of work. And some part of that work activity could involve knowledge and judgment-based work. Right? So we want to split that into those two parts. Because that part of a work activity right, that we can distill down to a, a rules-based procedure, that is a good candidate for automation. Those things that are knowledge and judgment, right, require knowledge and judgment and experience and decision-making and those kinds of things, are not so easily automated 
through RPA. Now in section two, I'll talk about RPA and artificial intelligence and some things like that. But for right now, just think about splitting the work activity into two components. Right? What's knowledge and judgment based and what is rules based, right? I call that splitting the atom of the work activity. And those things that are rules based and fit a certain criteria I'll talk about in part two, that can be automated through uh, business process automation, uh, robotic process automation kinds of things. All right, so just a little framework there to kind of give you some context of how we're going to think about this. So let's, use, let's talk about business process automation, and then a subset of business process automation is robotic process automation. So we talk about business process automation, right? We're talking about the whole end-to-end -end business process and all the tools and the techniques and how do we orchestrate and, and automate the end-to-end -end portions of a business process, right? So that's really what we're talking about here. Now, how do we do that? Well, there's vendor enterprise software. If you've got ERP type of solutions, there's a lot of workflow uh, orchestration and workflow management built into that. Uh, there are independent workflow products, right? Maybe we have a, a number of, uh, outside of our maybe core ERP systems, we have a, other, a lot of other systems as well that are specially pur purpose in nature. But we can uh, purchase vendor workflow solutions that ride across all of those and we'll integrate those at the, at the workflow level as well, right? We can do it from a technical standpoint, right? Uh, you know, tech, uh, developers with the right uh, kind of uh, technical background and experiences and things like that can actually, through uh, web service interfaces and APIs, and things like that, we can automate and integrate various uh, steps and work processes across the various workflows as well. Then there's RPA. RPA, Robotic Process Automation. I'm actually going to put on my link. Robotic Process Automation, RPA, enables automation at the user interface level, right? Technically non-invasive. And they are largely in therefore largely independent of the technical architecture of applications. Now that's an important distinction to make. So make a distinction between the first three, right? Enterprise software solutions, vendor, auto, soft, uh, vendor uh, workflow automation, uh, custom uh, automation kinds of things. The, the distinction, those three require uh, technical expertise and, and experiences and we have to kind of get into the, the software, into the, the database sometimes and into the code base or at least interact with APIs and things like that. RPA, right, is a hybrid approach using subject matter expertise or subject matter experts and the expertise of those subject matter experts and technical talent as needed. And the big, big takeaway I want you to get here, right, RPA, for the purpose of this discussion, is really works at the user interface level and is essentially mimicking human performance. So whatever the, a, a human is doing at the keyboard, so to speak, right, an RPA script can just automate it where automation and, and rules-based kinds of things kind of work. So really, we don't have to touch the underlying systems, the underlying software, the databases, and things like that. We're essentially mimicking human performance at the user interface level. Okay, so as, and as it evolves, and I'll talk about that in, in part two, uh, it, 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 as it evolves, it gets a little more sophistication in the kinds of things that RPA can do. All right, let's move on. So what is RPA? I'm going to quote the Gardner Group here. Now, many of you are probably familiar with the Gardner Group. The Gardner Group is, you know, is a thought leader in, in the technology space. And you know, how they define uh, RPA is this, right? It's a pro productivity tool, and I emphasize typically here, sold as licensed software, right? So we're not building RPA automations, although we could. We're talking about, when, the, when we talk about RPA, we're really talking about, you know, vendor software uh, bots that allow a user to configure one or more bots which act as scripts to activate keystrokes. It's just as simple, really, at its, at its core thing. The bots are just mimicking human performance. These bots overlay one or more software applications, right? So a particular bot can basically uh, do some keystrokes here, invoke some functionality in another system, do some keystrokes over there. The things, whatever, if you were watching maybe a human uh, do something with entering an invoice or maybe creating a, a, you know, a new account or something like that, if it can be rules-based, we can automate it at the front end through RPA, right? The bots can, uh, can be used to mimic or emulate selected tasks within an overall business uh, or IT pro process. So IT processes, business processes, wh whatever, if it's a process, there's opportunities for automating, right, if it's rules-based procedures. And this may include uh, manipulating data, passing data to and from different applications, triggering responses, executing transactions, and things like that. Okay. So from a Gardner Group's perspective, that's, that's the definition. Now, another way to think about it, 
is what I call the, the solving the, swi the, the, the swivel chair interface uh, problem. Now, what that, what that really means is a swivel chair interface means a particular actor, human actor, person, right, is interacting with multiple systems at the desktop level. Maybe it could be simple as just email comes in, a particular email, there's some data there we need to cut, you know, copy here, paste into something over here, right, that's a swivel chair. Maybe we have accounts receivable system over here and maybe a customer account management system over here and they're not integrated and so the, the user is copying some information here, pasting it over there, making, doing something over here, doing something there, and they're swiveling literally between uh, or among uh, multiple applications, right? So that's what the uh, concept of a swivel chair interface is, right? Now, people are effective when working on complex thinking processes. That's a big part of part three. I'm going to talk about, you know, the, the cognitive processes, the creative process, things that are truly superhuman strengths. People are very good at things like that, right? Critical thinking and complex processes and, and thinking. What people are not very good at is, is kind of, uh, you know, tedious, monotonous, rules-based tasks such as data entry, right? I call it just banging out the widgets, right? It's just, it's monotonous, it's routine, it's rules-based, and uh, it's just not a, people, that, for the most part, most people don't like doing that kind of work, right? So tedious, monotonous, rules-based kinds of work is just not the kind of things uh, people, not only do most people don't like it, they're not very good at it. And when I say they're not very good at it because it's tedious, routine, and monotonous, we make a lot of mistakes or mind drifts and things like that. But that is exactly where bots fit in, right? That is like use case number one, right? Being able to, to offload that routine, uh, monotonous, repetitive, kind of work. So this further, uh, further is a tip with data, you know, data, data, manually entering data, it, it takes time, it's, uh, it's error prone, we have to check for errors, it's just not a good thing, right? So you get the concept there. Um, what else we talk about here? Yep. So the swivel chair interface, right? It's just really when you think about it, it's a workaround. It's an interim workaround. The only reason people are working off of two or three screens on multiple systems at the same time is because systems aren't integrated, right? So it's sort of a stopgap solution <laughs> to it until uh, you know the, tech, the, the folks in uh, you know technology can go and actually you know properly integrate those particular systems. So again, that's where R RPA comes in, right? It also can be thought of as a stopgap solution where, well, you know we've got people doing this, and you know technology. I mean, they've got a backlog of all kinds of things they need to do, and they're always prioritizing and budget and things like that. But we can drive a lot of value very quickly through RPA by doing an RPA automation of things that are re redundant to repetitive uh, kind of tedious tasks, swivel chair kind of thinking, or tasks, I should say. Okay, so you, you get the concept there. Now, also, when we talk about RPA, and based on Gardner's definition, and generally the general body, body of thinking here, is what we're not talking about is what we call you know, the native capabilities of various software. Uh, say Excel is a good example, right? Excel, uh, you can build macros to do all kinds of things. You can you know, move the cell here, does the cell here, does this, creates that. And that's fine. That is that is RPA-like, right? Because we're automating those keystrokes through a macro. No, and nothing wrong with that. There's tremendous value to be in that. But it really lives in that particular box of that particular macro within that particular spreadsheet. It's typically not reaching across to other application systems and moving things back and forth. It's kind of living within that box. Now, I've got a little asterisk here. I put on the slide, and uh, everything I said uh, is true. But uh, in the case of, for example, you know, Microsoft create, created their Microsoft, the BI uh, Power BI tool set and their Power BI tools, and uh, you know, those Power BI tools actually allow a little bit more of that macro to spread across uh, a little bit more of uh, application domains, and uh, not necessarily advocated promoting it here. But they, uh, Microsoft has actually gone so far as to create their own uh, you know, uh, RPA tool as well. Uh, which is, you know, part of a whole whole lot of great uh, tools out there for RPA. Uh, this particular, uh, these workshops or uh, the, this uh, video, we're staying out of the vendor tool domain. We're not promoting any particular tool. There's a lot of fantastic tools out there. They've evolved. They do a lot of great things. The point I want to make in this slide is, when we talk about RPA, we're not talking about kind of macros within the footprint of a particular utility piece of software. We're talking about something that transcends uh, a vendor product that transcends multiple uh, applications. Okay, let's go back to the RPA versus uh, BPA kind of thing. And I shouldn't say versus, because that's not the way to look at it. RPA, RPA is a subset of BPA. Or robotic process automation is a subset 
of business process automation. All right. Business process automation, as it says up here, let's see if I can get my pointer tool to work. I just don't know why it's not doing it. All right, doesn't matter. But anyhow, the point is uh, RPA, uh, when we talk about BPA, it's a cohesive end-to-end -end solution to orchestrating, automating business process, right? End-to-end -end business process kind of things. RPA is a, is a subset of that. It typically works at the work activity level in the business process. So down here, we just have a very, very simple process just to illustrate the point I want to make. So our the BPA runs the scope of the entire process. So that is tools, techniques, and methods that will orchestrate and automate across the end-to-end -end process. As part of that automation orchestration, we could use various RPA bots at the various work activity levels. Maybe it was the order associate uh, classifies a particular order. Well, the classification could probably be automated. Or account specialist creates a customer account. Well, a big part of it could probably be automated. So RPA works at the individual work activity level, right? BPA is a set of tools, techniques, methods, technologies that span the entire business process. Right? So we're working here at the, the more micro subset level the, with RPA. What else can we talk about in that discussion there? Let's see. Now, RPA uh, provides automation uh, at, uh, tools, the bots that mimic uh, human performance at the interface level. We talked about that. RPA bots interact with applications in the same way that people do, right? Bots are configurable, you know, based on changes in processes and rules uh, over, over time. So that's a big takeaway I want to keep coming back to. Think of RPA is if you got somebody doing manual, tedious, repetitive kind of work at the desktop level, right? We can take a significant portion of that kind of work and automate it. And there's hybrid solutions where uh, the, the humans are doing certain things in a particular activity, uh, things that can be automated can be automated, so you know they're working together in that way. Well, some activities can be fully automated as well. And in part two, we're going to look at uh, about eight different examples. Yeah, about eight, nine different examples of RPA. Just to give you a whole spectrum of it in, in, in detail. All right, but you get, at, at least in part one here, you get the broad stroke concept. Now, advances in AI enable bots to learn and improve their performance over time. A good example of that is maybe we're doing something like, uh, I don't know, uh, entering invoices or something, right? Well, initially, maybe uh, the initial implementation of the bots, the bots can maybe handle 30%. You know, very standard, straightforward kind of invoices, uh, but they learn, right? And, and invoices don't fit that certain that certain sort of set of constraints get kicked off to a human operator, right? But AI uh, kind of observes what the human operator is doing. It learns from that, and it improves the uh, script over time. And so maybe we move up 30 40% over time, 50 60 maybe over 10 20 30,000 invoices. Maybe 80% of those invoices can are being in, uh, automated, and that other 20% that has exception kinds of conditions, right, will require some, some human performance kind of thing. So, again, AI is, is, is pushing into that area, you know, very strongly right now. Bots can be replicated to enable processes to scale, scale up and scale down. What I mean by that is, right, many organizations have a lot of peak periods. They could have seasonal peak periods. They could have daily peak periods, weekly peak periods, you know, end of month peak periods, whatever those cyclical uh, periods are. The beautiful thing about bots is they can be spun up and spun down based on demand. So maybe we have some particular spikes on certain days and we just turn on, you know, half a dozen more bots, you know, and so we can keep our, our baseline load, uh, you know, moving forward to meet our service intervals. Maybe after that peak period is, is toned down, we turn down the bots a little bit. It's a beautiful thing, highly scalable uh, type of solution to use those bots. Right. And bots are often referred to as a, a digital workforce. Right. So we've got the human workforce, we have the digital workforce, and they can work together uh, very well in many cases. All right, what else? Um, See, BPA versus IPA, we talked about that, uh, or it's kind of build of that, I should say, is one of the things we want to look at is right, the people in technology, right? IT or technology group, whatever. You know, there's a lot of different, there's the demands on everybody's time, right? not just IT. Everybody's pretty loaded. But IT is always working through a backlog, right? And, you know, and they're continually working through a back, backlog of all kinds of new technical developments and changes and, and revisions and things like that. And always sorting based on, uh, you know, uh, there's constraints, right? There's time, there's budget, there's talent constraints, all these kinds of things. And they're always trying to create the most value for an organization based on those constraints. So in many cases, and this is a really you know, important takeaway here, 
maybe some of the things that are kind of more, you know, manual, right, repetitive, those kinds of things are not maybe getting the mind share, the attention of, of uh, you know, people in technology in terms of grooming that backlog because they just don't maybe have the, the, the right or the high enough, uh, you know, value sort of uh, you know, proposition at a particular point in time, right? So that's where RPA comes in because to a large extent, I'm going to just flip down a few more bullet points here because I'm just going to talk through all these. Think about it is, uh, once we once uh, the R, your RPA program gets spun up to a certain level, you're definitely going to need the involvement of IT early on, just to build the infrastructure, build the guardrails, you know, these kinds of things, the policy, you know, all these kind, kinds of things around it. Then RPA can largely live in the domain of, of subject matter experts. They can build the scripts, they can maintain the scripts, they can maintain the bots, they can spin up the bots, they can do all the kinds of things uh, that need to be done to get tremendous value out of it. And then IT can kind of step in the background a little bit and, all, and then step in if things are needed, if, if you know, things need to be, need some technical intervention or, or these kinds of things, right? So the way to think about that is uh, BPA and RPA are complementary. I would say uh, the business functional areas and the SMEs and the IT people are a complementary in this particular world as well, right? And so kind of the best practice strategy is to, to use RPA for the quick wins at that tactical level, right? So building up those use cases, building up your talent, building up your, your knowledge, and then you can be a little bit more aggressive on how you start rolling out RPA in your organization. All right, so bots in the digital workforce, right? To kind of talk about that, RPA bots are key components of a digital workforce, just and enhances and supports human performance. I'm going to talk about that a lot in part two because digital work, the, the bots can really, it's not that they displace human actors, right? They actually enhance the work of the human workforce. That's a very important concept we'll build up in uh, part two and part three. Bots are process century, they're eccentric, they're highly effective and efficient in performing rules based work, right? They're not very good or they're, they're, they're when we get in creative and problem solving and things like that, they're not quite, they're not there yet, and it's going to be a long time before they are, perhaps. Uh, the augmentation by uh, by data analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning enables bots to sp start pressing a little bit more from just pure rules based work into some of the knowledge and judgment based work. It, not necessarily replacing the knowledge and judgment, but enhancing. Uh, uh, people that are doing it, right? We tee, tee up the analytics, uh, tee up some, some decision-making parameters and things like that really enhance and speed up uh, decision-making. And we'll see further advances in the cognitive science and natural language processes and vision and all kinds of things will, will continually enhance and be incorporated into the framework of bots as well over time. Okay, in part one, laid out the basic groundwork for RPA. Now, in part two, it starts to get a little interesting. I'm going to talk about how to spot RPA opportunities in your organization. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to analyze those opportunities as well. And then in part three, I'm going to talk about the role of people versus technology. Now, the spoiler alert here is technology and RPA is not going to, you know, it's, we're not going to be uh, run by our bot overlords, so to speak, right? And I'd say more like maybe the bots will be the underlords uh, under uh, human performance. And there's some this is a really interesting discussion, and I've spent some time really thinking about this and, and, and coming up with how to, how to think about that. Okay, so uh, looking forward to seeing you in part two. Uh, see you then.